Rachel Johnson is graduating today with a Bachelor of Science, having majored in biology. She's an Ann Arbor native, having graduated in the very first class of our local Skyline High School. Rachel is uncertain what comes next for her, but she's contemplating a career in the healthcare professions. Having an opportunity to increase her traveling history, where she's already visited Australia, Switzerland, and the Cook Islands, she intends to backpack through Europe with her best friend beginning later this week. That time will help her clear her head before she embarks on any of these future endeavors. Rachel played four years as a cardinal on the CUAA women's soccer team. She told me she's sincerely grateful for her awesome and very supportive parents who are with her here today. It's an honor to welcome a wonderful graduating senior like Rachel to be our student speaker. Rachel Johnson. Four years ago, if anyone had told me that I would stand up in front of a thousand plus people and speak for more than 30 seconds at commencement, I would have proceeded as follows. First, I would have laughed as it's my natural defense mechanism to discomfort. Then I probably would have cried and spiraled into perpetual worry about what I would say if I'd mess up or what people would think as I spoke. I'd continually visualize walking up here, tripping on the stairs, and then throwing up on the mic. <laughs> then I probably would have transferred schools to have avoid speaking at all. But thank goodness for the growth process in life and in faith. Today I know, and I am thankful for, the truth that my identity can be found in God, and in Him I can find peace, comfort, and live with courage. When I arrived at Concordia, I thought I knew who I was. I was Rachel Johnston, a soccer player, a biology major. I had a beautiful family support system. My sister was already here, and my dream was to attend med school. My mom would be happy because her chicks wouldn't be too far from the nest. I had a boyfriend. I was healthy. I considered myself Christian. I thought I was physically fit. I had a lot of ideas about who I was, but boy, oh boy, was I mistaken. Class, let's all think back to our first year at Concordia. For me, I was into academics, but maybe a little too much. Some of you were into a lot of other things, like making friends, pursuing your musical passion, excelling in your sport, or just trying to make sense of life after high school. Through our own experiences, many of us began to gain a clearer sense of our own identity. For a lost freshman like myself, this would require change, and I mean a lot of change. For some of us to be propelled into change, we can't simply ask to be changed. It usually takes a friendly nudge, a push, a two-hand shove, or the rug being ripped out from underneath us. For me, none of these were sufficient, so I broke my back. Literally, I broke my back. I was squatting for soccer, and in the span of six seconds, my sense of self-worth was stripped. The amount of time it took me to step out of the squat rack go down into a deep squat, and realize I could not stand up, my life was changed. It happened in slow motion. First, I tipped back and then to the floor, 115 pounds on my shoulders. The moment was imprinted on my mind. If you want to watch struggle, hurt an athlete. Tell them no for six months, for eight months. It changes them. Anatomically speaking, your vertebrae are what keep you upright, stable, and protect your spinal cord, which is the means of communication throughout the body. I was not stable. My structure was compromised, and I was broken. As a bio major, I continually thought about it in scientific terms. I'll refrain from boring you with all of the jargon, but basically, this was my wake-up call. This was my reality check. Where was my identity placed? Where was my security? In things that were temporary and could be stripped from me within seconds, or was my identity eternal? I give all the credit to God for helping me through the struggle. Romans 8.28 reads, 
And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, for those who have been called according to his purpose. This verse helped me through, and I strongly believe that even in our darkest moments, he can work all things for good. I think for the first time in my life, I realized that it's vital to identify in the one thing and the only thing that can never be taken from you. I think the beautiful thing about going to school here is the unique environment we find ourselves in, one that's immersed and based in God's love. When I first came here, I can honestly say that was one of the farthest things from my mind. But in the past year, I have come to value it more than I could ever say. Going to school here offers more than an education, but a place to grow and find ourselves in a relationship with God. This is something I know I will be grateful for far beyond my years here. Class of 2016, take a moment to think about who you were the first time you walked onto campus, the first lecture you sat through and didn't have a clue, the first time you ate in the calf, your first exam, the first collegiate game, first recital, first speech, all these firsts. Think about what you were like emotionally, physically, spiritually. What did you think? How did you feel? What did you look like? Now fast forward to this very moment, to the last lecture, the last exam, the last time you stepped on the court. All these firsts, the confidence you have gained, the courage you have found to be who you are, the strength you have acquired from hours in the weight room or the knowledge from days spent reading, the accomplishment that each of you have reached is nothing to be looked past. You are all so strong and brilliant in your own way. You've been placed here, exactly where you need to be. You've been blessed with the people in your lives, the lessons learned, the memories. It's all worth celebrating. You are all worth celebrating. And that being said, we couldn't have made it here on our own. Today, I hope you get to take a chance to thank and genuinely thank the people who have allowed us to be here. Our professors, parents, coaches, friends, family, and everyone in between. Thanks, guys. I could stand up here and ask you to chase your dreams and to be whoever you want to be, but what if I asked you guys, or more so said that I hope that each of you become exactly who God has created you to be? Over the past four years, I tried to be so many other people than myself. I tried to be a soccer player, a student, a girlfriend, outgoing, perfect, smart, the list could go on and on. But I never even bothered to ask God who he wanted me to be. So many people have tried to identify themselves with things other than who created them. Think about it in your own life. How do you identify yourself? How often do you sit down alone no phone, no noise, no distractions, and no time limit, and ask God what he wants with your life. How often do you take time to figure out what God made you for? What talents he has blessed you with? What is uniquely you? What drives you? What fills you with passion? What has God put in you that is uniquely you? Who are you, and where are you headed? For some of you, you're headed to grad school and your future has structure. And then there are you guys who are stepping into a job. Some of you are coming back here for another semester, but if you're like me, you don't have a clue as to what's gonna happen. You don't have a concrete plan and you don't even really know what the next few days or months are gonna look like. So whatever group you find yourself in, whatever group you identify with, think about what all of this means for you. I won't lie and say I was super thrilled to stand up here. Heck, if I knew what to say. I had a lot of thoughts and they were mostly pretty generic and pretty stereotypical of this day. And then they kind of spiraled into thoughts of, who am I to stand up here and speak? What do I know about life? And I know that there's gonna be a lot of people in this room who have a lot more life experience than I do. And it's funny how life works because that night I was reading a book, Scary Close by Donald Miller. And there was a sentence that practically punched me in the face and got rid of these false thoughts. It reads, this whole experience makes me wonder 
If the time we spend trying to become somebody people will love isn't time wasted, because the most powerful, most attractive person we can be is who we really are, an ever-changing being that is becoming and will never arrive, but has opinions about what is seen along the way. We all come from completely different experiences, and it's my hope that each of you can be yourself in whatever situation you find yourself in. So then the thought came to me, who am I not to stand up there? Who am I not to share my words? Who am I not to think my words will have value? And it's beautiful because this can apply to all of us. Think about it right now. How many of you are afraid to act, afraid to speak up, afraid to try something new or share an off-the-wall idea, to talk to somebody, to go after your dreams? Do you think to yourself, who am I to deserve this? Who am I to speak up? Who am I to say anything? Or is your self-dialogue a little different? Is it, who am I not to? We all have these moments where we are called to rise up, to take action, to speak out, to be heard. We're all called to act. We're all called to live. Who are we not to? And so the more and more I started to think about it, my day to day, it popped up all the time. I was continually challenged to rise up, to take courage, to do it, or to fold. A big part about life is that each and every day, we are presented with choices. If you're like me, sometimes choices are really, really hard. Do I eat chicken and kale for dinner, or do I go to Half Off Apps? <laughs> do I read, or do I binge watch Netflix? Do I share my perspective, or do I bite my tongue? Do I quit, or do I keep going? Every day, we are flooded with choices. Every day. And it's an important life skill to become aware of this. Become aware of the moments in life that are presented to us each and every day. How will you respond? Will you fold? Will you shrink back to a safe level? Will you wait for someone else to speak up? Will you wait for the job to be offered to you? Will you wait for the perfect moment when everything is perfectly in place to make the big leap? Or will you rise up Will you take the courage the Lord has given you? Will you do it? Will you, will you speak up for someone who needs to be heard? Will you introduce yourself? Will you show love to those who need it most? Will you chase the dreams God has placed in your heart? What will you do? I'll be totally transparent and say that I don't really have anything figured out. A couple weeks ago it was raining the good kind of rain where it's a steady downpour, a warm rain, the kind that makes you want to sit under a blanket, sip tea, hold hands, and talk about life. So I did my own version of that. I drove down to the river, and I sat in my car, and I sipped tea, and I watched the rain fall on the windshield. And I sat there, and the next thing I knew, I began to sob, real tears, really raw, really scared, really confused tears. And I was scared about the future. But then the tears stopped. And an overwhelming sense of peace and love came over me. And it hit me that I didn't have to be afraid. Because if God was on my side, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how lost I felt, no, I was never alone. God calls all of us to step forward with courage and with boldness. Not with fear, not with sadness, not with anxiety, but with courage. And then I cried again, but this time they were tears of joy, tears of peace and tears of comfort. And I'm not asking all of you to go out and cry alone in your car, but I do, I sincerely do hope for all of you the same sense of peace and the same sense of courage, that you will be able to step into tomorrow, no matter how uncertain it may be, with courage, with peace, with confidence, with hope, with joy, with love, because you know where your true identity lies, and you know the true strength and the true power that lies within you. That is my hope for you, class of 2016. Some of you have a plan. You know what's next. You know where you're going. Others of you haven't looked past today. Tomorrow is a new day, but you're not really sure what it looks like yet. Many of us probably fall somewhere on that spectrum. 
I firmly believe whether you are going to grad school or haven't the slightest clue, you can step forward in confidence because God is with you always. Whether we want to, to or not, today we all take the step forward together. Let's take the step in trusting that we can live with confidence and with boldness. Class of 2016, what will you do with the time God has given you? How will you identify yourself once you leave this room? I challenge you, each of you, to rise up, to take courage, and to do it. Thank you. Concordia University community celebrates with profound joy and gratitude our graduates like Travis who, who live out meaningful lives and mission and service to our Lord in the church and in the world. Another example of that is our speaker today, the Reverend Dr. Timothy Seleska is an example of a Concordia alum whose life and ministry is a significant one in terms of impact that it has on the lives of others. Dr. Seleska's love for the Holy Scripture was cultivated from a very young age. And there is a story that is a part of the Seleska family lore that underscores his desire to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the Word of God already as a youngster. One Christmas, when the children were making their lists for gifts, Tim's younger brother, Tom, professor of biology at Concordia University's Wisconsin campus and also with us today with the faculty, Tom requested a, a new baseball mint. Tim, meanwhile, asked for a Bible, and he's been studying it in depth and in detail ever since. God's people, Pastor Seleska's parishioners or Professor Seleska's students, have been the direct beneficiaries of the thoughtful insights that he has gleaned from that Word of God along the way. Since 1997, Dr. Seleska has been a member of the Concordia Seminary St. Louis faculty, and at present he serves as Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology and Dean of Ministerial Formation. He also previously served as Acting Placement Counselor, Editor of the Concordia Theological Online, and Director of the Master of Divinity and Residential Certificate Programs. Before joining the seminary, Dr. Seleska served as the pastor of Peace Lutheran Church in Cincinnati, and also St. Paul Lutheran Church in Napoleon, Ohio. Interestingly, during his time in Napoleon, Pastor Seleska served alongside this year's baccalaureate preacher, Peter Marsis. So it's really a great pleasure for Concordia to bring the team from St. Paul's back together again this weekend. A native Kansan, Tim Seleska holds an associate degree from St. John's College in Winfield, Kansas. That's where his father, John, was a longtime member of the Johnny faculty. His next stop then was here to Ann Arbor where he received his bachelor's degree from Concordia in 1978. He received his Master of Divinity from Concordia Seminary St. Louis and then while serving the pastorate in Cincinnati he began additional graduate study at Hebrew Union College there proceeded to earn the Master of Philosophy and the PhD degrees. Along with his classroom instruction frequent conference presentations Dr. Seleska has authored the Bible study God's Abiding Word, the Psalms for Concordia Publishing House He's also contributed to the lectionary commentary uh, from Erdman's and offered commentary for theological exegesis for Sunday's text, also Erdman's publishing. Also contributed articles to the Concordia Journal. His brother may have requested the baseball mitt, but Tim has always been an athlete and a sports fan. His love for the Concordia Cardinals is something we take for granted, but his passion for the St. Louis Cardinals is epic. Somewhat troublesome, too, I would say. But for added recreation, as further service to the seminary, Dr. Seleska also coaches the preacher's basketball team. Together, Tim and his dear wife, Diane, who is also here, a nurse and nurse educator, together they have three grown children and three grandchildren. And Concordia University welcomes our guest speaker, Timothy Seleska. On September 2nd, 1983, I was forced to watch a bloody fight. That's the day on which my wife's desire to give birth clashed with my oldest daughter's desire to stay put. So rather than coming gently into this world, my daughter Rebecca fought violently for 22 straight hours against my wife's body until the doctor actually was forced to go in there with forceps and pull Rebecca out by her head. Now after watching that fight for so long, I was totally exhausted. <laughs> and I was happy it was over. 
Little did I know that it was far from over. Little did I know that Rebecca's initial act of resistance was actually the way that she makes her way through this world. To call my daughter Rebecca stubborn would be a terrible understatement. She's the kind of person that she thinks that she can defeat the very reality and real conditions of our life. For example, when she was three years old, Becky figured she could deny her need for sleep. As was our custom, we used to put our children to bed at around 7.30, fall asleep on the couch, uh, sleep through the evening news, wake up halfway through Johnny Carson's monologue, then drive, drag our bodies to bed. On the way, we check our other kids who had been sound asleep for hours. Inevitably, when we passed Becky's room, she'd be sitting bolt upright in her bed with all of her dolls and toys piled in little mounds around her, playing as if it was in the middle of the afternoon. No amount of threatening, bargaining, or pleading would get her to lie down before she was ready. Diana and I finally had to leave her in the hands of God so that we could get some shut-eye. <laughs> but at that time, I started to wonder, what kind of kid are we raising here? Becky fought the good fight against sleep through high school and on to college, and I don't know how long after that. Becky also resisted the normal emotional support systems that parents love to deliver. For one thing, she didn't like to be held. When you tried to pick her up, she'd stiffen up like a board or else turn into a human slinky and squirm right out of your, out of your arms. Diane and I used to watch other parents holding and comforting their child, and we used to think to ourselves, what in the world are we doing wrong? One day when Becky was in the third grade, I was driving her and her brother Joshua to Grace Lutheran School in Cincinnati. And they were both in terrible moods, and I was doing my parental duty, my parental best to cheer them up. Come on, kids, it's going to be a great day, I said. You get to see your friends. You get to go out to play recess and play games. You get to learn long division. <laughs> At that point, Josh started softening, because he likes long division. But Becky would have no part of it. Dad, she interrupted me finally, your cheerfulness sickens me. <laughs> what kind of kid am I raising here, I thought to myself. I could give you many other examples like that. Now, as Becky grew older, the reasons for her obstinance continued to puzzle me. And I secretly wondered how she managed to have any friends at all, actually. Later, she actually told me, Dad, I really had to work hard at not being myself so that I could make friends. Now, that tells you something about the strength of her will. And my wife? Well, let's just say that Becky didn't get the stubbornness gene from me. <laughs> but even my lovely wife had trouble understanding my daughter, Rebecca. On more than one occasion, Diane would come to me for consolation, and she would say to me, Tim, I don't think Becky loves me. I don't even think she likes me very much. Now, when it came time to pick a college, Becky rejected our advice and went where she thought best. I know that she must have missed us sometime during those four years, but if she did, she was way too proud and way too stubborn to ever let on. Now, at the beginning of her senior year, she announced to us that she was going to go into the Teach for America program. That's a program that sends college grads into underserved areas across the country. Becky chose to go to Los Angeles, which was, of course, nowhere close to where Diane and I would have liked her to go. So they placed her in South Central LA at Southgate Middle School, which is a school that had about 3,000 sixth through eighth graders, making it one of the larger middle schools in the country. In the fall of 2006, Diane and I went to watch Becky teach. We pulled into the parking lot about the middle of the morning and walked toward a 12 foot high chain link fence that surrounded the entire campus. At the time, on top of the fence was spread razor wire around the entire campus. Now, razor wire does not exactly gladden a mother's heart. Now, understand that Becky had never been in charge of a classroom before. She had little preparation for this, no teaching practicum, no education classes. Uh, her program in college was nowhere near that. 
98% of the students at Southgate were Hispanic and English was their second language. Her job was to teach them math and science and she had to do it in English because the California standardized math and science tests were in English and funding for the school was linked to the passing rates of those tests. So Diane and I stood in the back of that stuffy classroom packed with 36 seventh and eighth graders. Day after day, it was just her and those students. She had no student aid. The textbooks that they had given her were dated. She did not have enough basic supplies, things like pencils, markers, crayons, construction paper, or regular paper. She had an old overhead projector that she could use, but she had no acetone sheets that she could write on to use them. In fact, Diane and I had to take her to Office Depot immediately after the school day and buy her all the supplies that she needed. When she had finished a simple science experiment that day, they had no towels or soap for the kids to wash their hands or wash off their desk. Now, I had been watching from the back of the classroom for a couple of minutes when two things happened to me. First of all, from the back of that classroom, the huge racial and economic dividing lines that exist in our country, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, became a felt experience for me, and not just a cognitive truth that I could keep at arm's length. And second, a question popped into my head. Could I ever have done what Becky is doing? My answer was immediately, there's no way I would have even have lasted a week. And the thought of having to come in there day after day, week after week, and teach those kids, frankly, made me feel very uneasy. But Becky had those kids in the palm of her hand. Not once the whole day did she raise her voice, and not once was she close to losing control of that classroom. In their short time together, those kids had already learned what Diane and I are still trying to wrap our minds around when it comes to our daughter, Rebecca. That it's no use trying to bend Rebecca's will because her will will not bend. The influence, the bending, is always going to go in the other direction. Which means that those little flames of fire sitting in that classroom had no chance against the iceberg that is my daughter, Rebecca. <laughs> And I could see that she immensely enjoyed the influence that she was having over those children. She enjoyed the artistic shaping of human minds. I could see that she loved those children. It was quite obvious to me that those children adored her. And it was at that point that some things about Becky began to make sense to me. Six years later, in 2012, she and her husband, Ryan, had our first grandson. His name is Sammy. Ryan, by the way, is a graduate of USC's law school, and although he could have had a job in a big law firm and made quite a comfortable living, he chose instead to become a public defender in Los Angeles. Call it his dream job. He told me once that he thought being a public defender was a great expression of the gospel. That too brought me up short. Anyway, when Sammy was a baby, Becky had a benign tumor removed from the base of her skull. And I don't know if it was because of all the MRIs that she had to have or the surgery itself or the medicines that she had to take. Uh, her and Ryan were unable to have any more children after that. But that didn't stop Becky or Ryan. They went through this arduous and time-consuming process of adoption. And last August, they were blessed with a two-and-a-half-year-old son named Godin. Now, they had had Godin in their house for about a week when Diane and I flew out to Los Angeles to visit them. And I have to tell you that the visit was overwhelming for us both. Little Sammy was still trying to wrap his mind around the fact that he suddenly had to share his room and his stuff with this new brother of his. And I could see that it was, he was really sad to us, really disturbed by it. Becky and Ryan, of course, were trying to cope with all the new responsibilities that came with this little guy. And Godin was still trying to wrap his mind around the world-changing event that had happened to him. 
And in fact, I think something from God's past still haunts him because from the time they got him until even today, God continues to wake up three or four times during the evening, crying sometimes at the top of his lungs, and he only goes to sleep with difficulty. And there are times during the day when he'll throw something or go into some kind of a tantrum for no visible reason. After a few days, you see, Diane and I were exhausted, and we were really worried whether this whole thing was even going to work out. Well, on the morning that we were supposed to fly home to St. Louis, Becky and Ryan got a call from their social worker telling them that Godin's birth mother had given birth to another little boy, and she was wondering if they would consider taking him into their home too. Now, Diane and I were rendered silent utterly speechless, probably for the first and last time in our life. But not Becky and Ryan. They took little Finn into their arms that same evening. And so in the course of 10 days, Becky and Ryan went from one three-and-a-half-year-old to a three-and-a-half-year-old boy, two-and-a-half-year-old boy, and a two-day-old infant. Now believe me when I say that this is a daunting and risky thing that Becky and Ryan are doing. In fact, they're probably going to have to move from their house because of circumstances surrounding it. But we have seen the children several times over the past eight months, and we can already see which way the bending of the wills is going. Becky still wins every battle. I'm totally convinced now that she always will. And I also know that the children are blessed for it. And as for me, I have gone from asking myself, what kind of person is this girl going to be, to me thinking, you know what? This is the kind of person that I need to be more like. It's a weird thing for a father to admit, but there it is. And now I finally understand what the Lord was doing when he made Becky the way he did. Because you see, when you mix her brand of stubbornness with her capacity to love, which I think is an ability that actually emerged in her later than it does in most people, when you mix those two together, you get this kind of unbelievable stubborn love. It's a radical kind of love that expresses itself in ways that go far beyond the normal boundaries. It expresses itself in ways that a normal person like me cannot even think of doing. See, Becky could have done many things. She has two master's degrees, and her professors at UCLA wanted her to go on to do more, but she gave up that path for those kids. Now, here's my point. On this day in particular, you're going to hear a lot about the word success. It's a word we're going to throw around a lot, as in, you have now successfully completed your course of studies, or today I want you to consider yourself a success. But you see, that word success is simply an empty abstraction. In order to articulate what it means for you, you have to fill it with content. And that's what you have been doing through most of your life, developing your own visions of success. And people have been helping you do that for good or bad as well. Your wonderful parents, for example, have been preparing you for most of your life so you can be successful when you get out in the world. The education that you have received here in this wonderful university has been preparing you so that you can be successful in whatever vocation you choose. Other voices around you have been giving contradictory or complementary definitions of success. So I want to add my two cents worth here in this fragment of a moment of your time when you are barely listening to me with the simple suggestion that you leave part of your definition of success to fill it with radical stories of love like the one I just told you about Becky and Ryan. Stories that make you stop and think. Most of those stories go unheralded, although you see them all around you. Which is why, to be quite honest with you today, I wanted to herald this one. Because of what stories like this have to offer us. We live in such a noisy and competitive world that it is very easy to forget who you are. People often get the impression, maybe from us Christians, that at its heart the Christian faith is nothing more than this conservative moral belief system that we want to impose on everyone else for their own good. 
So, for example, we have politicians telling us that we need to get our country back to its Christian values. And if we do that, then things are going to be better for us. But as a result, many people experience Christians as nothing more than moral policemen or ethical line drawers. Or many Christians may have the impression that at its heart, the Christian faith is really just this complex system of beliefs that is actually designed to make you successful. That if you put it on and follow its principles, then you're going to be tangibly blessed. So we get the idea that we can take on the Christian name but our definitions of success can continue to look pretty much like the rest of the world. Except now we can say that those pursuits have all been sanctified by God. But you see, none of that is right. At its heart, the Christian story is about the most radical act of love imaginable. It is the incomparable and incomprehensible story of the omnipotent God who is the creator and ruler of all things, who became obedient unto death for us. He could have done away with us. Instead, he died for us. He could have sent us to the grave. Instead, he raised his son from the dead and declares us forgiven. So instead of the grave, we get a crown of life. The promise that the Christian gospel gives us is so beautiful and humbling. I mean, think about it. Already when I was a baby, the Lord gave me some world-changing news at my baptism, for example. Tim, he said, I've adopted you into my family. You are now a brother of my risen Christ. And all that he has, I give to you. You see, it is this word of promise, this story, that is at the heart of our faith. Now, this probably means that our faith in the promises of God's word should not make us more comfortable with the lives that we live in this world. Our faith actually increases the disparity we sense between the promises for which we hope and the world that we now see with its suffering, with its death, with its injustice. The gospel certainly does create a space for lamenting and for dismay and for crying out, how long, O Lord? But the gospel also creates a space for us who are recipients of the radical love of God to love others radically. In this broken world, it should be clear to you by now that God does not need our acts of love. He does not need our money. He does not need our time. He does not need our talents. But the people around you do. And you can afford to be radical with your love. Because our Lord has not withheld anything from you. So in the gap between the promises for which we hope and the world in which we now live, radicalize your love. Make it stubborn. See what God can and will do through you. Thank you very much for listening.